Welcome to Sykes, the bottom line pharmacy podcast, your regular dose of pharmacy CPA advice to fuel your bottom line, featuring pharmacists, key vendors, and other innovators. Your checks, yes, you can call me, because we're the best Sykes and Company. Hi, welcome to another episode of the bottom line pharmacy podcast with uh, your host, Scotty Sykes, and the star of the show, Bonnie Bond, of course. And today we have... Bill Holmes and Matt Gilbert. Uh, Bill Holmes is the founder of RX Safe, and Matt Gilbert, VP Biz of Business Transformation and Major Accounts. So, thank you guys for joining us today and having a conversation with us. It's our pleasure. Always look forward to reaching out to the community, and uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun here today. Compliance packaging is not going anywhere. That's for sure. Um, it's certainly got all the room in the world to continue to grow, in my opinion. Um, especially with the long-term care at home now, uh, opportunities that are there and continue to hopefully expand in the future. What do you see there, Bill, with the changes in the long-term care at home space potentially uh, down the road? You know, how, how do you see that unfolding or evolving? Well, rather? The LTC at home, sometimes called medical at home space, is uh, is is interesting because uh, – very large number of current patients that pharmacies serve qualify as as what is you know referred to as medical at home or long term care at home, and NCPA uh, is doing a lot of work. Rana Hauser is is working every day to try to get better reimbursements for pharmacies, recognizing that you know as we have ten thousand people every day turn sixty five years old, that this baby boom baby boomer generation I'm right smack in the middle of it, you know we 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 hit the the, the market we hit we had every part of uh, you know the American economy starting from hospitals not having enough birthing rooms to you know kindergartens not having enough teachers to elementary school grade school high school college and then the first home and the first car and every segment of what's happened has been affected by this giant watermelon in the snake called the baby boomers. And so now what are we going to do with 10,000 people a day turning 65 as they enter into their senior years where they're going to require more health care and more medication and more personal care? There just aren't enough nursing homes. And as we saw with COVID, nursing homes aren't just necessarily a great place to be. And a lot of people don't want to be there. Uh, who's ever heard of Who's ever heard of a family story where the kids sat down with grandma and said, well, you know, grandma, I think it's time that we need to move you out of the home because you can't take care of yourself. We've got a nursing home in mind. And grandma said, fantastic. Let's do that. Let's that, do this. that never happens. It never happens. I'll go, time. I'll go pack a bag. <laughs> you know, my, my, dad, <laughs> my dad was a perfect example. You know, my mom had passed away 10 years earlier and he was a proud <laughs> World War II veteran. And he didn't, he didn't want to, you know, have any help. He was uh, suffering from wet AMD, which is macular degeneration. Your eyesight starts to go from the middle out. So your acuity ends up dissipa- dissipating. You can only see peripherally. And, you know, he was, he was struggling with that, but re- absolutely refused to leave his home, absolutely refused to have living care. He was just going to take care of himself. And he was doing great. Uh, until one day he mixed up his medications and and uh, didn't take them correctly and ended up in an ICU for six months and never never got out of bed. Uh, so for me, it's very personal, very very personal. And when you see people like that, ten thousand of them a day going into that phase of their lives, uh, what are we going to do to take care of them? What's the number one reason people are advised to leave their home and go into care setting? can't take their meds correctly. My dad is exactly that person. And so the consequences are grave. The need is high. How are we going to help people stay at home, live at home, and be healthy at home longer? Because there aren't enough nursing homes being built. There's not enough money in the economy to pay for it. And yet these people are going to need our pharmacies to find a way to support them in their lifestyle. The only way is adherence packaging. That is the only way. Now, these people will qualify for medical medical at home or LTC at home, as LTC, as uh, NCPA wants to call it. Uh, very simply, you get an attestation form, which is simple, eight and a half, eleven piece of paper that says 
I can't do my own gardening. I can't dress myself. I can't bathe myself. I can't cook for myself. I can't get to the pharmacy without assistance. You only need two of that list of things that you can't do to qualify for uh, uh, long-term care at home um, billing as opposed to retail billing. And so pharmacies, and I think Matt, would this be a good place for you to jump in? How does a pharmacy uh, benefit and how do they become a combo shop in order to take advantage of these existing patients who are already at home and they're already getting pharmacy um, uh, pharmaceuticals and many cases delivered to their home already. Yeah, yeah, most partner pharmacies we deal with, they don't even realize that they're serving that big of a population already. You're already delivering to them, you're doing it in compliance packaging, using pouch to get it out to them. You offer these high level clinical services that are required for LTC medical at home billing. So the, the easy way to, to get going with it is partner with uh, Jerry Med or MHA, get the contracting rolling, because that takes you know three or four months to get up and in place. And what they do is they set you up with uh, dual NCPDP, dual NPI, and it all sounds like a lot, but it's really just a, a little bit of work on the front end, and you're billing those in the same pharmacy software that you're using today, and you're serving those patients exactly the same way that you already were. But you're right. getting, you know, two to five dollars more reimbursement per prescription for doing the same exact work. So who wouldn't be on board with that? Right. Yeah, and through that through that mechanism, if you can partner with uh, 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 NCPA, you can partner with Jerry Med, you can partner with MHA. They will all have advice and assistance to get you into that model. But you can then use the contract you have with your current wholesaler through, for example, Jerry Med. And you get lower costs and, and many of the drugs that you would acquire for this use for medical at home or LTC at home. You also get higher reimbursements because there's a recognition by the payor that you're doing this adherence packaging and it costs more. And then, of course, you get the absolute avoidance of DIR fees because they don't apply to LTC environments. So when you think about lower costs, higher reimbursements and no DIR fees uh, and they're patients you already serve, uh, it's an absolutely undeniable benefit to pharmacy owners. Add yeah. to that other services that you can bill for. Matt, maybe you could dive into that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing people get hung up on, too, is the LTC part. Well, I'm, I'm a retail pharmacy. I, I'm, I'm stuck on the bench. I, I don't have time for this. You know, I don't want to expand and serve in skilled facilities. And that's not what we're talking about at all here. We're talking about partnering with uh, Happier at Home, home health agencies that are local to you, really serving these nurses well and treating their their patients that are residing at their own individual homes really well and building them into your orbit. Uh, but to take it to the next step, which is what we as a company have focused on for the last, you know, call it 12 to 18 months, is not only taking the, the patients to pouch on that journey and the medical at home billing journey, but getting our pharmacies up and running with RTM programs. So now we're serving a patient in a pouch, and instead of putting it in a regular paper box, like it's in, is in front of Bill there, we put them in a dispensing box that looks basically the same, but it tracks the patient as they move through the month, and they're making sure we're accurate with every dose that it's being taken. And all that's monitored, and that's a billable service out to CMS. Yeah. So you take those, again, those same patients that you're already serving, you're already delivering to in compliance packaging, get the Jerry Med benefits or medical at home benefits of it, and then take an enhanced reimbursement and open yourself up for some more clinical services, uh, whether it's in-home immunizations or RTM dispensing. Talk about the RTM. How does a pharmacy get going with the RTM billing? Yeah, yeah. So we, we've, got a, we've got a few partner RTM companies that we work with currently, um, so we'd be happy to, to refer people on to them. But uh, what they do is a, a initial analysis of your existing patient population. They show you who qualifies out of your entire roster of patients currently. And the way they do that is mapping back and forth between the drugs, the GPI, and then to the therapeutic categories that are billable. And they, they do all that heavy lifting. You just download a report out of Pioneer, Liberty, whoever you're using, and they analyze that. And they'll say, here's the direct correlation revenue-wise if you move these patients over to this type of billing. And for most of these patients, there's no out-of-pocket expense either. So it's not like you're going to a patient and saying, hey, you know, I've got this great new service, but it costs 50 bucks a month. There, there's no out-of-pocket for the majority of those patients. So right. it's a pretty turnkey solution. 
Easy enough. What about, um, Matt, talk, talk to us about, you mentioned uh, earlier about uh, supplements in the um, compliance packaging. Uh, kind of expand on that and your experience in that area. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got a, a few different ways people are playing it. You know, we've got a lot of great customers, got over a thousand customers all together, and they all do it a little bit differently. We've got some guys, they're doing standalone vitamin packs. So it'd be a women's pack, men's pack, bone health pack, heart health pack. Some get, some of these guys have 50 different packs that they're out there and they keep their patients sticky by being an adherence pouch packaging. So, you know, if you missed your morning's dose, right. And I always correlate it back to my dad takes one medication. He takes it out of a vial every single day. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've been over their house. Hey dad, did you take your Lipitor this morning? Oh, I don't know. Let me, let me back count it. Let me see. Oh. And then he, he can't figure it out. So he says, well, you know, <laughs> heck with it. I'll, I'll catch back up tomorrow. Well, that doesn't happen with pouch packaging. If I go and I see my morning dose is still there at 11 o'clock and I missed it at 8 a.m., I'm going to take it, you know, and get back adherent. So we've got a lot of our folks who they're doing standalone supplement packs. But I think the, the overarching theme is to look at nutrient depletion that your current patients are having affected by their other medications they're taking. And they might be going out to Costco or some big box store and buying those vitamins and you don't even know about it. Yep. So the, the easiest lift that I tell our partner pharmacies to do is every every patient, every month, when they drop off their scripts or they pick up their scripts, you have a prompt in their POS system, hey, are you taking any new vitamins or nutri nutraceuticals outside of us? And then counsel them based on what they're taking and then try to rope that into their compliance packaging. And, and then it and, keeps them sticky and increases those terms. And pharmacy pharmacists should be the the experts in the supplemental area, but you see supplements everywhere. Uh, GNC is it, or yeah. even pop-up shops selling Online gas stuff. stations. I mean, it is crazy. <laughs> the opportunity yeah. for pharmacies with supplements, I think yeah. is huge out there. And, and to give yeah, them uh, a <laughs> yeah, sorry. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, anecdotal stories. Uh, we, we had a panel discussion at the MLC show a couple weeks ago and, and Joe Williams, who is um, uh, serving seven counties, soon to be nine counties in, in southeastern North Carolina, uh, an excellent operator who's been running a rapid pack now for about four years. Uh, he was reluctant because his patient population is rather low income to sort of recommend, you know, hey, you should be taking this vitamin, you should be taking this nutraceutical, uh, you should be replenishing the, the depletion uh, that, that this drug causes. Uh, because he didn't think they, they just they couldn't afford it. And uh, recently he's become aware that those very same patients who he's re you know, reluctant to talk to are buying one of these on TV ad uh, commercials that some athletes holding up saying, you know, take this medication and it's going to be uh, a whole different life for you. Where if you read the little white print on the bottom of the screen is it's not been verified by, you know, any, uh, any entity and we don't claim any results. And and yet people are spending thirty, forty, fifty dollars a month on these subscription models. Uh, and he's basically now saying, well, let me let me find out who's doing that because they're wasting their money. They're not buying the right nutraceutical for their their current clinical requirements. And he's now uh, converted a lot of people over who thank him for that because they're healthier and they're spending less money and they're taking them correctly. We've got people like uh, Easton Bryant, who is uh, another rapid pack owner, very successful that got into a, a good, you know, web advertising campaign about strip packaging nutraceuticals and has customers buying from him as far away as Japan. And so he's now mail ordering this stuff all over the country. In fact, probably mailing to some, so to one of our listeners in their back door to a customer that's, you know, one of their pharmacy right. customers. And so here's an opportunity that's ripe for the picking. Uh, we've got uh, Kelby Gorman down in Texas doing, uh, Matt, how, how many uh, packs is he doing? Uh, well, he's doing over $50,000 a month just in standalone supplement pack sales. See, see, that's what I'm talking about. Just about every pharmacy should have that opportunity. Yep. And it, it's, not, and it's, not, not, it's not a heavy lift. You know, it, you, you're bulk ordering this stuff and you don't have to make up a thousand boxes at a time. You know, you're just replenishing yourself and your uh, shelf and you see what works out there mm -hmm. with your current patient base because it's different in every area, right? You know, there's going to be certain price points that you want to target, but you want to have them have good quality, you know, vitamins and nutraceuticals and not not just junk that's not going to work. If they see the effects 
and they're on. They're going to keep using it. Yeah. it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's, um, you know, it's a higher margin business than pharmaceutical, typically 50% or greater margins and no DIR fees. And yep. once you get somebody in your store who's interested in buying your nutraceuticals, what are you going to ask about the cash register? Are you filling any prescriptions down the street? Why don't you bring them here and I'll combine them in this package for you? Yep. Hmm. It's a no brainer to me. Yeah. I mean, so talk to us about uh, the automation space um, just in general. Um, I mean, shoot, we still have a lot of pharmacies that have no automation. I mean, we still see pharmacies with no automation whatsoever. Um, obviously, payroll is very expensive these days outside of cost of goods and the R fees in years past. Uh, payroll was top expense in a pharmacy. Um, with your experience, Bill, Matt, um, expand on how you see automation um, cut down on that payroll expense um and what opportunities there are for pharmacies yeah it's it's an interesting topic and you know i'll start by saying uh, i get this question all the time at all the trade shows and we do uh, about 35 trade shows a year um j bill you know i i, I love this automation <laughs> i'm here covering it up uh, <clears throat> it's expensive uh, i just don't think i'm big enough maybe i'll think about it in a couple of years and, you know, typically in the past, when you thought about a vial filling robot from Parada or Scripto, for example, it was true. You'd have to get to 150, 200, you know, vials a day to make it sort of pay off because those robots produce 100 to 150 vials an hour. Uh, when you think about spending $200,000 for a piece of automation that you only use an hour a day, you have to question, is that a good use of your capital? Because it really doesn't make sense to have an idle piece of automation in your pharmacy. And so those decisions, you know, sort of get to scale, then buy automation, get to scale, then buy automation. And, you know, I think of that, and, and even with our, our RX safe in the corner here, this tall white machine, that would be a true statement. You do need enough business to make it make sense to get a return on that investment. But when you start talking about strip packaging, uh, it's a completely different topic, because as opposed to an efficiency tool like that, this is a growth tool. Right. This can help you actually add patients and grow your business much faster than you can do any other way. Uh, you go to pharmacy school for five, six, seven years. You come out. You do not have a business degree. You do not have a finance degree. You don't, you don't have an operations, you know, industrial degree. Uh, you're a pharmacist. And it's tough to say, well, okay, now I'm going to become a marketer. I'm going to become a sales salesperson. I'm going to go into my market space and grow it. Uh, that's difficult. And most of our pharmacy owners really struggle with that. Well, Matt's group inside of RxSafe is special specializing in that. He will physically come or his staff will come to your facility and go with you to other pharmacy opportunities. And and Matt, if you could just expand on that for a second, uh, yeah, it'd be yeah. interesting to see how do we help you grow? Because you can get this machine in the earliest stages of starting a new pharmacy and say, okay, it would have taken me a year to get to 100 patients, two years to get to 200 or whatever. We can accelerate that. Because this is a viral thing. When when patients take this box home and they become adherent and become healthier, they're going to tell their family. They're going to bring at least one family member to your store. And they're going to tell their friends and bring at least one friend to your store. And then you look at the geometric progression of it. They tell their friends and they tell their friends and they tell their friends. We've got pharmacies like Cleveland Clinic, for example, doing 900 patients a month with one or two people operating that. And if you just assume it's 10, 10 prescriptions and let's say 1,000 patients uh, that's 10,000 prescriptions a month with two technicians. Nobody can match that. Matt? Yeah. Yeah. And what, what my team specifically does is we want really want to make sure that the, the end customer, in our case, the pharmacy, is successful. And out of all, I, I talk to thousands and thousands of pharmacists and pharmacy owners every year, and 99% of them tell me, Matt, I'm not a sales guy. I'm not a marketing guy. I don't have a sales team. I don't know how to market myself. I don't know who to target. How do I do that? And that's that's where our team comes in. Um, so what we do is we do a, a market total market analysis of all the home health agencies, group homes, ICF IADs, assisted living, skilled if they're if they want to go tap into that market, corrections, 
And then we fly out there for two days and we take the pharmacy owner with us. And sometimes it's the pick that goes with us as well. Sometimes it's a, it's a super tech that they want as part of that adherence packaging. But we show them how to market pouch packaging and into each of these different silos because they're all different, right? You're going to have skilled and assisted living are going to have their own pain points. Home health nurses are going to have their own pain points. ICFs are going to have their own pain points. So we go and we pick up on whatever that pain point is and drive home pouch packaging as part of the solution. So getting that initial entry into the door and show them how to have that conversation. Now we're teaching them how to fish, right? Nice. So going yeah. forward, they're looping back with those same director of nursing, the same uh, assisted living uh, administrators, the same. Uh, I've, I've been in more jails. I've never been in jail outside <laughs> RX Safe, but I've been in more jails and prisons in the last three years than I ever thought I would be. But these guys need it. You know, if you've got three, 400 inmates that you have to do a morning med pass, a noon med pass, an afternoon med pass, and a bedtime med pass. Yeah, it's perfect. How long do you think that takes doing bingo cards or vials? It takes hours. By the time the next med pass shows up, they're not ready. So we had a customer, a uh, rapid pack customer down in Kentucky. He had a jail right down the road from him, 200 beds, all cash. So no, no DIR fees, no PBMs. And I said, man, are you serving that jail down there? He said, no, nah, I've tried a bunch of times. I can't get in there. At the time before the rapid pack, they only had blister cards. He said, I've talked to him a ton. They just won't move. We went in there, had about an hour conversation with the warden, said, here's what we can do on pricing. Here's the modality we're going to distribute in the rapid pack pouch packaging. And he got that deal. And that was something he had knocked on their door for five years before and couldn't do. And we did in about an hour. So, you know, uh, to, to really partner with our pharmacies, we want to make sure they're successful because if they are, we are. Yeah, that sounds like a great program. Does, Matt, does that have a particular name? Yeah, so it's the Business Transformation Program, and uh, I'm, I'm over that. i got some teammates that, uh, that work with me on that, but we do it every week. So we've, we've done hundreds of them at this point, and sometimes two or three a week, depending on the volume. So you all fly out to the location? We do. Yeah, we do. We do the flying. We do the driving. We'll take the take the pharmacy owner around and we have 15 to 20 meetings each day that we're there. And uh, they've got a whole roster of follow up notes and key contacts and everybody that they've got to pursue after that. And then we're we're here in perpetuity as far as, you know, hey, Matt, you know, I, I got this assisted living. They're asking for this. I have no idea what they're talking about. OK, sure. Let's hop on a call. So it's not uh, it's not a, you know, hand it off to them and you're on your own. Right. It's, I'm, I'm, getting cust I'm getting customers from that I worked with three years ago that I just had one yesterday that called me asking about med cards. You know, what type of med card should I get? All right, we'll help you out with that. It's yeah, not just fantastic. about how packaging. Yeah, I think it's a, a great point to interject that you know, if you're a pharmacy owner and you're looking to uh, find an automation solution that you should find somebody who's willing to partner with you. Uh, a lot of people are in the, I'll sell it to you. Thank you for the business and handshake and, and on to the next thing. Uh, we're not we're not like that here. We look at our 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 customers, our pharmacy owners, as partners. And for me, it's very personal because you know we we've, we've designed and developed all of our own equipment at RxSafe. We don't import anything from South Korea. We don't import anything from Japan. We don't import anything from Holland. It's all our own creation, and it's next generation, latest state of the art stuff because we don't copy other people. If you look at the other strip packaging machines in the world. They're all the same. They all use these silly little plastic cassettes that were invented in 1907. I mean, look at look at Google it. This first the first evidence of a rotary disc with a pill of a certain size that has to drop through a little hole in the bottom was 1907 in the form of a gumball machine. The other thing I really ob object to about the rest of the state of the art stuff is there's this hole in the bottom of this cassette. Um, that's an open container, Scotty. Any way you cut it, any way you describe it. The medication in here is exposed to air and moisture for hours, weeks, days, even months. And everyone knows when you own a pharmacy or you work in a pharmacy, first thing you want to make sure you do every day is you put that cap back on the bottle and you tighten it. I ask every pharmacy owner, if you had a bottle on a shelf with a cap off of it, how long would you keep it? And would you serve a patient with that? And the answer is a couple hours, that's it. And so here we have open containers and I really object to that. So we've developed everything that we've done here based on people coming to us at trade shows and saying, hey, I'm worried about this. Can you guys do this? Is there a way to do this better? What would it look like if this were to happen? And how can you help us? 
And all of this stuff is not my idea. All of it is their idea. And so we get that, and we're very proud of that. We partner with people in order to, to facilitate that, and that's a long-term partnership. As Matt describes our success in different markets, and it's ubiquitous. I can't think of a place that we've gone that we haven't driven new business into a pharmacy just by being asked to do it. But if we can get you 30 new patients with 10 meds each, with $10 profit per med, you'll have $3,000 more profit in your pharmacy per month, $3,000 a month. That's more than the lease payment on the equipment, and that's just 30. Uh, you can play with the math. If you think it's $5 reimbursement, then make it 60. It always works out to be the same thing. It's easy to drive this. And we have programs that you know postpone payments three months as much as six months with our leasing partners like Advantage Financial, Pete Davison. Um, so a lot of our owners have bought this equipment using Pete's plan, have made a payment for six months, and have easily got to that three, for three, four thousand, five thousand dollars a month more profit before they had to make their first payment. No cash out of pocket. And I know that you can talk, Scotty, with uh, with great authority about Section 179 and the benefits at the end of the year. So you know the the relative cost of the machine is down, and and, and maybe is it sixty percent this year? That's uh, uh, that's the number. Bonus depreciation, 60% this year with the chance of that being changed with the tax law that's pending out in Congress right now. So we'll see where that goes. But uh, depreciation still aggressive. You still got 179 um, where you could potentially write off the whole piece of equipment. Um, so it's going to be interesting here from a tax planning perspective because, you know, how this year's starting off, it's, it's a rough go with the DR fees and the, the change in reimbursements. Um, so there could be some opportunities for pharmacies here towards the latter part of the year to uh, artificially create losses, um, offset other income, and get some refunds back in their pockets. So there'll be some tax planning opportunities, I'm sure, for pharmacies with these uh, with the rough year so yep. far this year. Yep. And uh, talk to a lot of owners. Uh, as I said, we've we've uh, been around a long time. We go to a lot of trade shows. Uh, the, 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 the strong industry leading operators that we've already mentioned earlier here all tell me that they think we're in the bottom of the trough. What does that mean? Well, DIR fees, uh, low reimbursements, um, the, the PBMs and their, uh, you know, aggressive draconian practices, uh, are, have, have reached the attention of Congress and, and lawmakers, uh, in, in a serious way. Uh, RxSafe was instrumental in raising money for the Legal Defense Fund of NA, uh, NCPA uh, just before the Supreme Court ruling on uh, the Arkansas case against PBMs in that in that state, and we were successful. If you recall, the, the justices voted eight to zero in favor of Leslie Rutledge and uh, Mark in in the the law they passed in Arkansas. So things are coming back. They've gone too far. Everybody knows they've gone too far, but the uh, I think it's an optimistic time. I think we're coming out of the trough. I think the IR fees are going to be uh, le less and less as time passes. I think the visibility uh, in January of the IR fees, while we still have that overlap of old DIR fees and new DIR fees, um, people now understand when they're losing money. And if I could, you know, point to a conversation I had with Doug Hoey, the, the CEO of NCPA, a while back, you know, he and I were commiserating about this. And he said, you know, Bill, I, I hate the thought of this. But I think the reality is uh, maybe it is time for pharmacy owners to look at a patient and say, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, uh, I can't continue to lose $100 a month filling this prescription for you. Will you please take this one to CVS? And, uh, and, I, and I believe that's happening now. Oh, it's uh, happening. And, it is. Yeah. and when that does, when that continues on, and you know, let's take CVS as the bad guy um, in this model. Uh, they have an insurance company, they have a PBM, right? So they, they kind of own the problem. And and now it's going to come home to roost. You know, if they're asked to keep filling these prescriptions at a loss, maybe they'll wake up some morning and go, ah, reform doesn't sound so bad. Right. Yeah. But it's definitely going on. We hear that every day now. From a, our well, they're in front of Congress right now talking about PBM issues. Yes, they know, are. They're holding yeah. signs out in front of Congress about reform PBM, this and that. So it's definitely got the attention there in Congress. It's, 
it's just got to happen. They got to get it to the finish line. And, you know, Lord only knows with Congress, because I think that same tax bill I was mentioning is also wrapped into the PBM um, reforms, if you will, in Congress as well. So um, it's just got to get to that finish line, but we'll, we'll have to see and cross our fingers. Uh, well, you're right there, Bill. I hope we're, I hope we're starting to move. Well, guys, upward. listen, <laughs> you, you, have, you have always been a strong advocate and supporter of the independently owned pharmacy market and industry uh, as we are. You know, 90% of our business is independently owned mom and pop pharmacies. Uh, I, I am every day I wake up and I tell Matt and the rest of our team, every decision we make today has to start with one and most important fact, and that is, are we doing something to improve patient health? Number one, is this vendor or that vendor, is this cost or that cost, is this, is this trade show or that trade show important? Everyone is, well, is this gonna improve patient health? That's number one. Number two is how can we improve the financial health of our pharmacy customers? That's number two. They need to be strong, they need to be financially solid, they need to continue doing what they're doing. And then third, what's the best thing for Rx Safe? because we'll take care of that automatically through number one and number two. If we lose the independently owned pharmacies in this country, and the number has diminished year over year over year over year, if we lose it, we're going to take that healthcare that's available five minutes from everybody's front door and make that far less accessible and far more expensive and patients are going to suffer. We cannot turn this over to chains. We cannot turn this over to, to big corporate environments. Uh, we can't turn it over to healthcare systems. They're not close enough, and they're not the front lines that we need. And we saw that during COVID with uh, vaccinations. So we need to help. All of us need to help independent pharmacy owners become uh, stronger. And I think we're in the bottom of the trough. I'm very optimistic about the future. I think that if you're considering uh, automating and doing strip packaging, improving your adherence programs and your uh, other programs, uh, do it sooner than later, because I think the community really, really needs your help. I agree. That was a heck of a bottom line there, Scotty. <laughs> that that was. Are you going to go into our bottom line segment? I mean, I think it? Bill just took care of it. Do you have something else to add? At the end of each podcast, we always have a bottom line. But I think Bill kind of wrapped that one up. Matt? How about I, Matt? I agree. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in here. I agree with Bill. I think... I think we are at the bottom of the, the trough. Um, and <clears throat> I think there is a, a lot of opportunity ahead for pharma independent pharmacy is just too vital in, in this country. Um, yeah. you know, you can't just get rid of all independence. That's not gonna, that can't happen. Um, <clears throat> and so that's that opportunity in pharmacy, I think where, um, you know, these independents can really, and we say this all the time, can evolve into that healthcare center in their communities. And that's yeah. just going to continue. Um, and that's where I think the, uh, the future is with pharmacy. That includes um, the long-term care at home space. That includes um, just general healthcare, supplements, uh, deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies. I mean, the list goes on and on, but accessible, easy healthcare five minutes down the street. Uh, you don't have to have an appointment. You walk in uh, and get a various uh, array of services. I mean, that is the future of pharmacy and that's where it's going to go. Um, so I, I believe there's a lot of opportunity. There's just going to have to get through this PBM crap uh, yeah. before we get there. Um, but again, like I mentioned, they're in front of Congress now with these signs, reform PBM. So that's never happened as long as I've been around in pharmacy here. So I think there is a, a bright side on the other on the other end, but that would be my bottom line. Matt, how about you? Yeah, my my bottom line is uh, the pharmacist is the the most trusted practitioner, health practitioner that any patient's going to deal with, and and they've got the they've got the buy in of that patient because they they trust them, they've known them for years. They can they can go to that store and they know the person working the cash register and they know the tech that's filling their prescriptions and they know the pharmacist has their back when it comes to their medications. So so keeping all these uh, pharmacists head above water, uh, we're trying to help them do that in any way that we can. So that that's my bottom line. We're we're here to help in any way that we can. So whether it's yeah, pouch awesome. or card or vial filling, 
you know, we'll, we'll do whatever we can to make sure they're successful. And one, one linchpin that I want to leave everyone thinking about here as we end this, uh, this hour together is uh, seven and a half to 11 and a half. If you look at any statistics today at NCPA publishes this year in and year out, the average refills for chronic patients on medication are seven and a half times out of 12 for a year. Average, seven and a half. If you ask doctors what's the most frustrating thing about patients who keep coming back because they're not uh, recovering, they're not healthy, they're having issues or complaints, uh, the number one thing they discover is their patients aren't taking the meds correctly. Recently, I did a speech in front of a bunch of pharmacists and uh, we had about uh, 500 people in the room and I asked a simple question. How many people here who run a pharmacy think that their patients are taking the medications every month that they prescribe? Not one hand came up, not one. And we know the statistics are well documenting this fact. If you have patients on adherence medication, like this strip packaging, it goes from seven and a half refills to 11 and a half refills. So that's great. My first, my first point is patient health. We've improved patient health. You take your drugs correctly and the doctors will thank you, the families will thank you, and the patients will thank you, and your bottom line will thank you. You'll go up 40% in revenue and 40% in profit because you're losing that in your current patients today when they don't come back for refills. So please consider adherence packaging. Yep. Very nice. Well, thank you guys for uh, hopping on with us today on the Bottom Line Pharmacy Podcast. Always great to have... Uh, uh, be with you, Bill, on on the panel. We've we've been on a couple panels together, and yep. uh, we certainly appreciate you hopping on today. So uh, I'm sure we'll see you at a trade show this summer. And uh, thank you all for listening in. Thanks, and thank you. It's great. Thank you guys. Yeah. Appreciate you, Bonnie.